Hey, Beth. Hey nice there. Thank awesome. you. Nice to be here. Yeah. Awesome to have you on the uh, podcast and chat. I know as we were chatting a little before, we have a mutual friend, Lindsay, who was actually on a prior podcast episode a couple ago. So I'm um, glad to have you on here and chat about this because, you know, one of the things when, when we first got connected, I found is that we have actually a very similar line. You know, my mission uh, with the Just Get Started podcast is, you know, and really the mantra is you don't discover happiness until you discover yourself. And I know with some of the stuff I was researching on y'all, it's like you really understand it and help people understand like, yeah, physique's one thing, nutrition's one thing, but they have to start actually deciding to make the change and the commitment and stuff like that. And, and that's really what I wanted to talk with you about is like, there's so many levers people can pull. And a lot of folks just get, I think, hung up of like, where do I start? I don't know what yeah. to do. Um, so as a, let's kind of warm up the muscles here as we're, it's like we're getting in the gym here early. Uh, <laughs> why don't, I would love for you just as a, as a quick, maybe to help folks understand, because I think it's always cool. You know, people have so much different knowledge and insight of where they came from. What got you interested in like nutrition and health and, and fitness and stuff? Was there like a turning point in your life? Like that you could share. I'm just kind of curious maybe to, to warm things up, you know, share with the yeah. audience a little bit. So I was actually a, a two sport athlete in college. I've always been a competitive athlete and I needed an outlet for that competitive nature post-graduation. So I got into the gym and I didn't really have any goals. I didn't really know anything about lifting weights outside of what I had learned in college from my, you know, soccer and softball teams. Um, and I decided to just throw my hat into the ring for a figure competition. And there was a coach locally uh, at my gym who was a, a trainer. And so I partnered up with her and I started to lift consistently and do all the things that bodybuilders do, like eat a bunch of chicken breast and do cardio and lift right. heavy weights and all that kind of stuff. And started to actually see my body change for the first time in I don't know how long. So I started to see shoulder development and bicep development and quad development. And I was really excited about that. And I thought it was really cool to be able to actually go to the gym and nourish your body in a certain way and lift in a certain way that actually resulted in you being able to physically change the way that your body looked. That was kind of a, a new thing to me. So that really is what kind of spurred my interest in just the health and fitness industry in general and how I can gain as much knowledge as possible and help other people to achieve their goals, even if they weren't similar to mine. So I don't, I don't prep bodybuilders today. That's not what I do. Um, but people that are, that enjoy health and fitness and want to be healthier, more fit people, that really is kind of where my passion lies. Well, I mean, I think that's also, you know, we looked at anyone, I mean, I could take myself even as like with CrossFit when I started about five years ago and look at my body then, you know, I tell this story. I was like, I, I was doing a lot of beach body stuff. I had just finished, I think it was called core de force. It was like a kind of a kickboxing, <laughs> you know, whatever. Uh -huh. And anyways, I was 170 pounds and I'm pretty tall and lanky as it is. So I was like 170 pounds, like no muscle. Yeah. And I remember like, you know, I have pictures from even six or eight months later, just doing CrossFit consistently. And it's like, whoa, I mean, I gained like, now again, this is intentional, but I sure. gained like 20 pounds and I had like a lot, I could see a lot of muscle and I was like, oh my God. So maybe a similar, but different to your story it was like, right. wow, if I put the time and effort in, if I make a commitment to this, yes. it's, it's not 20 years down the road. Now it's not right. going to be tomorrow. But there is some, you know, kind of level of quote unquote success, whatever that is for you. So, and I right. think that that's what's cool about, you know, and I'm sure you see this a lot with the folks you work with is like, you start seeing minor improvements, you know, maybe it's they, you know, they're running a little bit less time for a mile, or maybe it's small little things of like they see in their physique in the mirror. And those little things are really interesting uh, because yeah. we all have them differently, obviously, but being able to push forward and saying, gosh, I see this here. Let me give it some momentum forward, you know? Yeah, Absolutely. So I thought with the the conversation, and this is maybe a good kind of jump off point, we could help so many different people today, right? And again, there's a wide ranging folks, but let's take kind of the average person. So let's mm -hmm. take someone, we'll take someone maybe that's in their 30s or 40s. Um, they don't get to work out hardly ever. Maybe it's mm -hmm. they, you know, they walk around the block here and there, go on a hike or whatever, but they don't actually get in the gym or they're not, you know, they're not doing things actively per week. They maybe have gained. I don't know, pick a number, 15, 30 pounds, something like that, maybe since their twenties and that they have so much stuff going on. Right. So, you know, they have kids and they have kids. extracurriculars and whatever. 
Sure. So let's talk, if we can, maybe today, let's break down this episode and how do we help folks get started in all different facets? So I'll let you kind of, dealer's choice here. If you want to start with physical fitness, if you want to start with nutrition, if you want to start with sleep, like you pick I, where you want to start. And then we I'm going to start there. with a very basic, but this is literally the number one thing that can help somebody like this okay. is just walking. It sounds so simplistic and so easy, but I would say on average, the, the typical client that comes to me when they first start, they're probably averaging, I would say anywhere from 2000 to 4,000 steps a day. Okay. That is completely sedentary. And I'm not saying that you need to be one of these people that walks, you know, 20,000 steps a day. That's not, that's not what's needed to all of a sudden have a huge breakthrough, but small incremental increases in that step count or what we call NEAT or non-exercise activity thermogenesis, which is the calories that you burn at just existing over the course of your day. So the calories that you burn just breathing and, and living things like fidgeting, you know, tapping your toes, tapping your fingers, your step count, those all contribute to what we call NEAT that actually can, that counts towards about 20% of your daily caloric expenditure. So okay. if you bump up those steps from say two to 4,000 to even six to 8,000, you're gonna be burning twice as many calories a day as you were prior to increasing your step count. That is the number one area where people immediate, can immediately start to see benefits is just walking a little bit more over the course of their day. Just so I show up, but maybe other people have this thought, if, if you did nothing, if I laid in bed all day, and maybe I ate some food. How many, what, what's like the, what's the number? What's like the base level with that neat number that you would have? Um, reference point. That, that's kind of hard to, cause it's going to depend on your body composition, your age, okay. all that, all that other kind of stuff. But, um, I would say probably 15, like 1200 to 1500 basic. Right. Okay. So that's without, you know, without consuming any calories, that's just your body's basic needs for existing. Um, so if you are, if you're a type of person that gets no activity on top of that, if you're trying to lose body fat, mm -hmm. you are going to have to set your caloric intake very low to combat the lack of activity, the lack of physical activity that you have during the course of the day. So these are the people who often will report to you, you know, I'm eating 1200 calories a day, but I'm not losing weight. The first thing that I look at for those people is how much they move around over the course of the day. And almost all of them barely move. So if you want to eat more, you need to move a little bit more as well during the course of the day. So they're typically, you know, th their general exercises, walking to the bathroom, maybe it's if they, if they work in an office, a lot of people are remote now, but yep. like if they work in the office, they're, they're maybe good in their car and walking. That's about the extent of it. Exactly. Exactly. And a lot of people think that they get a lot more steps than they actually do. Um, we, and the number one profession for this, and this is no hate or anything like that, but um, healthcare workers actually all, always say, oh, I get so many steps over the course of the day. I'm always walking around the hospital. But when you slap a pedometer on them, three to 4,000 steps a day. Now that's not every single healthcare worker. I think people that work in the ER or the ICU or the NICU are probably getting more steps over the course of the day than somebody else who's maybe in, you know, some type of administrative role within the hospital. But a lot of healthcare workers will swear up and down that they're getting 10 to 15,000 steps a day. And then you put a pedometer on them and they're, they're barely moving. And it can be a really eye-opening experience for people to actually get a pedometer that measures your gait and use that versus a wearable, like a watch or a ring, which usually measure your arm swings. If you get a pedometer that actually measures your gait distance, and then you wear that over the course of the day, I think a lot of people would be surprised at how little they actually move. And just anecdotally myself, the first time that I ever wore a pedometer to test this, and I'm physically active, right? Like I don't consider myself sedentary by any stretch of the imagination. I was getting about five to 6,000 steps a day. Wow. And that's you know, pretty low. <laughs> well, because I, you know, it's funny you talk about the watch. I, my son has like a, I don't even know what it is, some some Fitbit or something like that watch. But I'm like, 
I wonder if if moving his arms like that, playing his video games actually counts as, as activity and movement. It can, you know? it can. Yeah. It usually will will do arm swings. And granted, that is neat, right? That is a form yeah. of like if you're if you talk with your hands a lot, that is non exercise activity thermogenesis. But if I'm really trying to put a label on this and put a number on it and get some quantifiable data, a pedometer really is a great way to be able to do that. Um, and it just, the, the wearables, so the watches and the rings that you get will count your arm swings. So if you're like painting your house or if you're brushing your teeth or brushing your hair, um, it will pick that up as a, as a quote unquote step versus a pedometer, which is actually measuring your, your gait. Where do you, this is a dumb question. Where do you wear the pedometer? Like where, where you can clip it. Most of them are okay. like, they have a little clip thing on them. So you can clip it to your belt or your jacket oh, okay. or okay. something like that. Yeah. Or you can even just put it in your pocket. Okay. Yeah. So would you encourage then? So you talked about walking. Would you encourage if folks are like, well, I really, you know, I want to go for a run because they feel like, Hey, I can run. Would you rather say, Hey, why don't you do a fast paced walk over running? Would that be better? Cause maybe they can go longer or It'll depend on what they actually want to do more and what they're more excited about doing. So I am a major advocate of people doing what is what they love to do. So somebody wants to run, but let's say they haven't run in a long time. I might say, okay, you know, you can go for some short jogs or maybe we do some running mixed with walking, especially if you haven't run in a very long time to all of a sudden try to get up and go run three miles might not be the best idea. So for somebody like that, I would say, why don't we do a couple rounds of run at an easy pace for a minute and then walk for a minute, run for a minute, walk for a minute. And let's slowly start to work up our running distance by doing a combination of running and walking. But whatever is going to excite that person and make them stay with it for a longer period of time is what I would encourage them to do. So for some people that might be doing some running mixed with some walking for other people that might just be adding in, you know, a five to 10 minute walk over the course of their day or on their lunch break or something like that. And we even encourage little things that people might not think of. So um, one of the biggest areas where you can get more steps is whenever you go to the grocery store, park in literally the farthest spot away from the entrance to the store as possible at any store, honestly, like Target, Home Depot, wherever it is that you're going, park in legitimately the farthest spot away from the door as possible, and then return your cart to back inside the store versus the closest cart return. I can guarantee you, you'll get double the amount of steps. If you do just that one little thing over the course of your week, it will really add up the steps for you. So if you're part, if you work in a building every single day that you go into work, park in the spot, that's the farthest away. And this is when people will start to kick back stuff to you like, Oh, you know, in North Carolina, it's freezing right now. I don't want to do that. It's really, really cold. Again, it, it comes down to active choices, right? So you, if, if that's not something that you want to do, okay, that's fine. Then we need to find another area where you can actually get some more steps in over the course of your day. What are you actually willing to do to start to make this change? So you can do things like if you're talking on the phone to your mom and she's a chatty Kathy, walk around your house while you're talking to her. Just start walking, pace, do whatever you need to do. While you're brushing your teeth at night, walk around your house. Um, if you're listening to a podcast, walk around somewhere, all these things that we do that we normally do in a sedentary nature, you can usually do them ambulatory and walking around. Well, and, and even the walking, like I've been doing, you know, cause I work remote and, you know, I'll walk, you know, on a meeting or I'll walk, listen to a podcast. And even in, in addition to the CrossFit workouts, because I, mm -hmm. I've actually found just, you know, a lot of the stuff, I don't know if you follow Andrew Huberman or not, but a lot of stuff he talks about of getting the, the correct sun exposure to be able to help you with sleep. So even folks just getting mm -hmm. outside yeah. is good for your just overall health and, and well being as it is. Um, yep. So, I mean, I, I, I definitely sign up for the, the whole walking. What about, so if we're, again, we're saying, Hey, the average person, let's get them out there. What about mixing in body weight exercises? Is that encouraged? Is that not is what, I'd what, rather somebody do, something? I'd rather somebody do body weight versus nothing at all. So if, if body weight is going to be an introduction for them to potentially get into the gym and actually do some resistance training down the road, then body weight stuff is a great way to introduce that. And especially if you're talking about somebody who maybe doesn't want to leave the home too often, then body weight stuff is a great choice for that type of person. 
um, at home. There's, there's plenty of, of body weight workouts that you can find on YouTube online. Um, that's a great way to get somebody started and introduced into, um, into resistance training down the road. So if that's a good stepping stone for a person, if that's what they're willing to do right now, hundred percent on board with that. Do you ever encourage your clients to like have a, a certain time, meaning instead of going, let's say in their garage for 20 minutes and doing, you know, again, a certain body weight circuit workout or something, but Hey, every 10 minutes do 10 pushups or something like something. Does it matter if it's over the course of a day or having it in the chunk period? Like, I, I, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, no, that's a good question. Um, as long as it's done over the course of the day, it doesn't, it doesn't really matter it, in terms of timing of it. Um, so if somebody wants to do, if somebody has a, a timer on their desk and they set it to go off every hour. And when that timer goes off, they get down and do 10 pushups and 10 setups. Cool. I'm all for making things literally as easy as possible. You will rarely hear me say no to something like that. If that is going to help that person continue to put one foot in front of the other in a habitual manner. So all of this stuff is about habits and habit stacking, right? So we want to, we want to meet the person where they are currently and start adding those, those little easy habits one by one and just very slowly chipping away and adding very, very slowly and very methodically over time to get that person to, to keep pushing themselves because they're eventually going to start seeing results, right? So if they walk a little bit more, if they're doing some body weight stuff at home and they all of a sudden drop five pounds in two months, that might be motivation for that person to say, okay, you know what? I'm ready to now start running. And then they lose another two pounds over the course of the next month. And okay, now I'm going to get a gym membership and now I'm going to start really lifting weights. That's exactly what we want. What we don't want is to inundate somebody with all of this minutia that doesn't matter, right? Like nutrient timing and specific bodybuilding programs. Like that is not what that type of person wants or needs, nor is it something that they can commit to. You always have to meet the person where they are when you're talking just starting out with fitness and starting to build those habits to a healthier lifestyle. Yeah. The, so another, yeah. another plug that I want to give for oh, meat, um, I, cause I actually had a client who did this recently. Um, she does work remotely. She works from home, but it's really, really difficult for her to just because of the nature of her job to get up, you know, like every hour to go for a quick five minute walk. So she actually got something. My husband actually has one here under the desk. It's called a desk cycle. And so it literally sits underneath your desk and you put your feet in it and you literally just cycle in it. Like you don't, your upper body is not moving. It's just your lower body. I could be sitting in here cycling right now and you would never even know. Fantastic option for oh, okay. getting your need up. And they have them on Amazon. They're not that expensive. Super great way to get in some extra neat during the course of your day. Okay. Wow. That's, I think I've seen that. I've seen like yeah. a treadmill. I mean, I guess you don't have to go the whole treadmill yeah. route. The, the cycle is probably the best route. The treadmill is a little bit harder because you can only walk, like if you're typing something, you can only walk so quickly, right? Or if you're speaking to somebody and you're walking really fast, you're, you may not be able to actually carry on a conversation with somebody. So some of those treadmills, I think they max out at like a certain pace. Like you can't actually be, you know, run on them. Um, but I think the desk cycle is probably a little bit more user friendly for somebody who's really just starting out to use that versus those desk treadmills. I love the idea of the desk treadmill. I just don't know how feasible that is for a lot of people. Yeah. Well, I, I want to go back to and something you mentioned kind of reminded me about, you know, we're talking about habits and I think that's the big thing here. It's like, how do you, and you know, James Clear probably gets more shout outs in this podcast with Atomic, <laughs> Atomic Habits. Atomic I, Habits, I, I yeah. I always recommend folks that book because I think, one, he simplifies it so much. Yeah. And how do you chunk this out, you know, into the, like you're saying, the, the little small nuggets versus, you know, trying to bite off more than you can chew. And I think that's where a lot of folks, and I, I used to struggle with this all the time because it's like, I don't want to go to the gym for two hours. I mean, that's yeah. that's what appealed to me with Beachbody, I think, initially. Yeah. It's like, okay, I could do a 30-minute workout. Or it's a little quicker. But again, yeah. what's what's the availability? Um, right. Do you find that most of your clients, or do you get a lot that are like, ah, Beth, I really want to do this. I just don't have the time. I can't find the time. Like, is that the main excuse you hear? Like, what's the excuse you hear the most from folks? This is going off on a way tangent, but I'm kind of curious, like, when foot when you're talking about hey these, this is kind of what I would recommend here and there they're like I don't know I just don't have the time is that it's, the biggest excuse 
it's it's a couple of things. Time is usually what people will try to say, but if you start to dig, that's not really actually what the problem is. So, and this this could be a little bit controversial, but in what I have seen with my clients, it comes down to legitimately whether or not the person is truly ready to make a change because people will find an excuse for the smallest habit change. So like I was telling you the, you know, returning the cart to back inside the store, Mm -hmm. the person that really does not really want to change will have an excuse even for that. So they'll use the weather as an excuse, right? So people really need to be extremely introspective when they're starting out on a fitness journey and really think about their why, what problem is this going to solve for you is kind of the way that I like to, to think about that. Um, and a lot of people go after some of these goals for the wrong reasons. They think that losing weight or whatever their goal may be is going to make them happier And then they start to get on this journey and they realize that that's not actually the case. So they just don't see the point in doing it anymore versus thinking really long-term of, I want to be able to attend my daughter's wedding in 30 years, or I want to be able to meet my grandchildren in 50 years. They're not really thinking long about their long-term physicality and health and wellness. They're thinking short-term, how is this going to help me immediately? And that's not always the best way to be conceptualizing your health and fitness goals. So I actually don't love goals. That's a a controversial thing to say as a coach. Um, I think people really mess up with goal setting very regularly and they shoot for the moon when they really need to just be taking a tiny little step. Yeah. And goal setting is, is an art form really. Um, and, and setting correct goals that can be measured that are actually attainable and feasible for a person. I mean, how many times have I heard as a coach, you know, I want to lose 20 pounds in a month. Like I'm not your girl. If that's the kid, like I'm not going to starve you to death. I'm not going to make you do cardio for hours on end to make you lose 20 pounds in a month. That is a, an unattainable unsustainable, unfeasible goal for just about everybody. But a lot of people will come into this process with very lofty goals and unrealistic expectations. And when that light bulb moment hits, when they say, aha, this is actually not truly achievable, unless I actually change who I am as a person, they'll find any excuse in the book, whether it be time, whether it be finances, what have you, they'll, they'll find a way. Well, I mean, let's sit on that for a second, because I think that's really important. The whole, whether it's 20, 30, 10, whatever it ends up being. Yeah, I, I think the challenge with that, and, and I'm curious your thoughts on this, but like when you say 20, that's great, right? I want to get the pot of gold in the rainbow, but like, how do you get there? I exactly. think that's the whole thing is like, if exactly. you map out a strategy and you do these things, could you reach it? I don't know. Everyone's body is different. Sure. Right. I don't know. Maybe it's 10, maybe it's 12. But like, and again, mate, this is, this is random, but like what I found with CrossFit and I found with doing some other stuff in, in fitness is like, you might lose 10, but because just the way your body is, you might feel so much better. Like tw- why, why is it 20? Right. Like, where did you come up with? 20? Where'd you come up with that number? Yeah. You know? Yeah. So I think that's really important. What, how do you, like, again, do you, do you have that kind of deep discussion, I guess, up front of like, we have to yeah. make a plan first. Yes. And, yeah. And Cause I, number. yeah. Cause I have had, you know, we have an intake form that we have all of our clients fill out and we have them list out their goals and their expectations. And I would say the, the largest part of my job actually is in that upfront piece of looking at that person's goals and having to give them that feedback of like, Hey man, listen, this ain't going to happen. Like, I'm just, I'm just going to tell you right now, what you're looking to do is not possible in the amount of time that you have given yourself to do it. And it, I mean, it could be if you wanted to eat 800 calories a day and go run for five hours. Sure. You know, maybe you could do that, but I'm not as a, as a coach, I'm not going to do that to you. I refuse to do that to somebody to help them meet their goals. That's just not what I'm going to do. So I do have to have those conversations very frequently with people about you need to 
first of all, just remove a number. Like I hate number goals in general. Like I want to lose X many pounds by X, by X date. I don't like calendar goals and I don't like number goals at all. Like, let's just remove those from, from the equation. But even before I say that to the person, I'll, I'll ask them, okay, if this is your goal, here's what you're going to need to do to hit it. You're going to need to be eating from this particular list of foods that's going to help you achieve that goal. So, you know, protein, vegetables, all that kind of good stuff. Here's the type of lifting that you're going to need to be doing. You're going to need to be in the gym probably four to five days a week for maybe an hour and a half to two hours at a time. Are all of these things actually things that you can commit to right now in your life as it, as it is? can you commit to these things right now? And nine times out of 10, the answer is no, but they just don't, they don't know that that's, that that's what is needed to achieve those goals. So level setting and setting those expectations with clients up front is a huge, it's probably the largest piece of my job up front. Do you prefer, so again, let's talk about goals for a second, because whether people listen to this conversation and, and agree or disagree, they're going to probably set, everyone sets goals in some capacity, right? right? We sure. kind of, so how our society is, but would you encourage, I don't know, I don't know where I'm going with this, but <laughs> I think like setting a goal of, I'm not saying running a marathon, but Hey, I've never ran a 5k. Sure. I would love to do that. I'm going to, I'm going to sign up for one in six months and work toward doing that. Would like that be a better goal than the weight loss goal? Would you encourage folks or like, I would say, don't even set a six month goal for that. I would say if you want to run a 5k, okay, we can work towards a 5k don't put a time frame on it because there's there's only so much that you can control right so let's say somebody in your family dies next week and that takes you down for the count for months like let's say you become depressed and you can't train the way that you want to there are unforeseen things that can happen in your life that pop up that make timetables really really unfeasible for most people. So while I'm more than okay with having a goal of being able to being physically capable of running a 5k, I think is a great goal. I would encourage you to not put a time frame on that. Okay. Yeah, I I always think about it from a standpoint of like, you know, some people have to have the dangle of the carrot out there in front of them. Sure. So I didn't know if that was something uh to consider or not. Um, I mean, it, it can be, but the person just has to realize it, it, it depends. It's going to depend on the client as well. Like with all things, fitness and nutrition, it depends is kind of always the answer, right? Because somebody could have something that happens to them and they're not really affected by it versus somebody could have the same thing happen to them and they're down for the count for three weeks. Yeah, so now yeah. you're three weeks behind on your six month schedule. And now what are you? So now you're going to probably miss your goal. So what is that going to do to you mentally? There's people that missing a goal completely takes everything out of the equation for them. And that's that's sort of where my mentality comes from is I've seen that happen too frequently to too many people where they set these goals with either a certain number or a certain date on a calendar and something unforeseen happens to them that throws off that timeline and throws off their results and they can never recover from that. So what do they do? They completely give up. And that's what I try to avoid with goal setting is not setting a goal that is going to make you completely give up if you don't hit it. Yeah. So if you know that you're not going to hit that goal, how can we adjust? How do we amend that goal to something that is more feasible? So for, you know, for example, that six month mark, like let's say something comes up and all of a sudden now you're two months behind on your training. Are you going to be okay with potentially unregistering from that 5k that you've registered for right. yeah. and move it to maybe six months later. So those, those are all the types of things that you can think about because one person might be okay with that and the other person might not be. Mm -hmm. So it's going to be very dependent upon the person as well and how well they can pivot when unforeseen stuff happens to them in their lives. And unfortunately, I feel like so much unforeseen stuff happens to us. I mean, like, look what happened with, with COVID. I mean, that's just... I don't think anybody saw that coming and how many people did that throw for a loop? You know, yeah. there's some people that still haven't recovered from that. Yeah. So, I mean, you can't, there's only so much that you can control. You can control what you do every single day. You can control every meal that you eat. You can control every workout that you can do. So if you want to run a 5k, how about we set weekly, maybe weekly distance goals 
right? Mm -hmm. And the weekly distance goals will work you up to being able to do a 5k in six months. But maybe let's put the pause button on registering for that 5k until we have stacked up some solid weeks of getting appropriate amounts of distance in to be able to work us up to that goal. Well, and you mentioned earlier too, is the accountability and maybe we can talk about this a little later, but like, it's one thing to say, I want to change, but then it's the commit to the change. Like I'm going to right. make the commitment. I'm going to show up at the gym or I'm going to do the, you know, again, I'm going to shop properly when I go to the grocery store, those type of things, Right. Uh, which is, which is uh, maybe I think actually where I want to go next, if that's okay. So sure. kind of put some fences around, start walking, obviously pedometer could be good. You know, if you want to do some mix in some body weight, but just kind of get moving. Just get your, de your death cycle. I'm going to try to yep. find a link to that. And yeah, and I can send you one afterwards if you want me to. Yeah, <laughs> because we I we have one on Amazon that we recommend to um to some people. So okay, I can cool. send that to you for Please sure. Please do. Yeah. Well, let's talk about nutrition then. So you mentioned that yeah, you can make the choice to eat whatever number of meals you're eating per day. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, we don't always make those choices. So let, right. let's again, someone's getting started and like, all right. 2023, I'm ready to do this. Like, I'm going to eat better. How do we Where start? Do you start? <laughs> well, first, Besides I would throwing I, out your entire pantry. Right. right. I mean, <laughs> the first thing that I would want to do is just kind of have an intake of what that person is currently consuming, because we can't really make any suggestions mm -hmm. unless we know what you're currently doing. Right. So not even based on calories, but just food selection. So the biggest ticket items for me are liquid calories. So those are the easiest things to get rid of first. So, um, you know, we actually had a client who um, he was consuming a day, 850 calories in just coffee creamer. Like oh that God. is a, subs and he was very sedentary. So already we're at this dude can barely eat anything in order to just sustain his body weight because he's consuming almost his daily caloric requirement and just was he sugar. drinking like the, like punch so, bowls of this? I'm no, not sure. so I think, he how was, do you get to 850? So I mean, if you are using a full fat, full sugar uh, creamer, yeah, yeah. um, those are pretty calorically dense. And if you have eight to ten cups of coffee a day and you're dumping like Gosh. a quarter of a cup into each cup of coffee that you're drinking that stuff adds up really quickly, yeah. very quickly. And liquid calories will do that to you because you don't see it sitting in front of you all in one, one plate, right? So you, it's hard for you to really kind of quantify how much of that type of thing that you're consuming. Yeah. So things like regular sodas, fruit juices, coffee creamers, those types of things are the easiest swaps to make. So sweet tea instead of here in the Carolinas, <laughs> right? I mean, just, and if you, if you swapped sweet tea for unsweet tea, I mean, yeah. the amount of calories that you would save yourself is insane. Yeah. Um, so same thing for diet soda versus regular soda. If somebody still wants to have a soda or two over the course of their day, I would much prefer to that for them to have a diet soda than a regular soda, merely for the caloric impact that that soda is going to have on them. And same thing for the coffee creamers. They have sugar-free creamers available that are like 15 calories per serving or something like that, much better than 50 calories per serving, right? So looking for the little swaps and the little areas, I would never tell a person you have to completely cut out all sodas, both diet and regular. You have to completely cut out all of your coffee creamer. Don't take away people's joy. That is what makes a diet unsustainable is, is stripping those things away that the person really does enjoy. I, for example, I love my sugar-free coffee creamer. If you took that away from me, I just wouldn't drink coffee. And I love my coffee in the morning. So for me, it's worth it. Those 15 calories that I'm getting from that creamer are worth it to me to consume. It makes me happy in the morning, right? It makes me yeah. not strangle people at work. So that is that is an important thing for me to keep in my diet over the course of the day. So if somebody is drinking two to three, four, five regular sodas a day, that person probably likes the taste of soda, right? So having a, a calorie free version of that soda that tastes pretty similar is not a bad swap to make to start. Well, so liquid. And well, I was just going to, sorry, I didn't interrupt. I was just going to add though on that. I think the, the point though, and this goes back to even what we're talking about the, the exercise it's the incremental change. Like if we were able yes. to look back a year from now and say, oh, you went from four sodas to three and then from three to two and two to one. And yep. maybe you have one every few days. And it's like, 
it's not going to be exactly. right away. Now, some people are like, you know, sometimes I kind of get in that mode of like, I'm kind of a, you know, cold turkey, whatever, just kind uh-huh. of go. Uh-huh. But again, I think that's, I, this goes back to knowing yourself. How do exactly. you normally work? What What's your personality like? And what can you handle? But I think that Bingo. slow movement, if you look years down the road, it could be monumental. Right? Absolutely. So you don't have to start day one and you know cut everything out. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry. I interrupted your thought there. You had a good one going. So I don't, no, know, that's I don't okay. know if I took you off. No, that's okay. So liquid calories is, is the, the really kind of the first okay. area that I'll start with somebody, because like I said, those, you know, fruit juices are another just super high calorie. Like those are another thing that it's pretty easy to kind of take out of the equation. So, and again, to your point, this comes to knowing the person, you have to have these conversations with people to figure out what they're willing to part ways with and what they're willing to not part ways with, because it, it needs to be sustainable long-term and the best diet. It's, it's not keto. It's not intermittent fasting. It has, if it has a name, it's not, it's likely not a sustainable diet. The most sustainable nutritional approach is the one that you are going to be able to adhere to for the longest amount of time. So, and, and that is controlling your overall caloric intake. So what can we do to help you balance calories in versus calories out? That's, it's a math problem at the end of the day. So the next big ticket item is protein. And protein is a hard one because most people are vastly under eating it, especially women. Um, And it is a satiating. So it's a filling macronutrient, meaning if you were to eat 200 calories of chicken breast or 200 calories of pop tarts, which one is going to keep you fuller for longer? It's going to be the protein. But that means that each meal that you eat that has that protein in it people feel really full at first when they start eating more protein. So the the quantity of food that they're eating is actually less, but they will report higher amounts of satiety because they're not used to eating that much protein. So that's a hard one to introduce. So typically what I'll do with people that don't, that are, that eat maybe 90 to hundred grams of protein a day, and we're looking to increase that, I will just add it to one extra meal over the course of their day and start there. So instead of one meal a day with protein in it, now we're eating two meals a day. And then we slowly start to bump that up over time. And I also look at the type of protein that somebody is eating. So if somebody is eating a super high fat protein, so a really high fat ground beef, like anything that is, you know, 85% or even less lean than that, not a great choice versus a more lean ground beef, 90% or greater. So again, those are little swaps that you can start to make. So chicken thighs versus chicken breast, things that are leaner and overall have a better health profile. Those little tiny swaps are what we will start to make with people. Um, And additionally, stuff that people may not think of like cottage cheese, Greek yogurt, there's plenty of ways to dress those up that make them taste really good that can help people start to get more protein in. But that's usually ticket item number two is getting somebody to increase the quantity of protein that they're eating over the course of the day. You said something earlier that my curiosity peaked. Why why do women eat less protein? What, what was the, why do you find that is the case? I don't know if it's just, we just generally are not big meat eaters. Um, but women tend to eat higher carbohydrate and higher fat diets. So I know that, you know, the joke is like women love chocolate, whatever, but it is true that we tend to eat more carbohydrates and more fats than we do protein. I don't know if it's some sort of hormonal or a biological mechanism via which we do this, but women tend to under eat protein much more than men do. Um, I think also we're just like, we're not really I don't, I'll be honest with you. I am one of those people that if I'm not really paying attention to how much protein I eat over the course of the day, I'll under eat it. And it's just because I don't love, you know, just kind of gnawing down on a chicken breast. It's not my favorite thing to do for the course of the day. I'd rather eat, you know, some cereal or or like, a, you know, something like that. So it's just, it's more food selection and food preference in terms of what women like to eat. Um, which is why stuff like Greek yogurt and cottage cheese and that kind of thing can actually be a great addition um, because you can make those things sweet. You know, you can make them feel a little bit more like a dessert than a protein. And that can really help people a lot. Okay. So we got, you're going to start, take out the liquid calories, going to add in some more protein. 
what's next? Well, I'm, are you going down to the veggies and fruits route? Or are we going? Well, to- <laughs> I mean, I think that's an obvious one, right? Because yeah. most people, most people will will eat fruits over vegetables, and that's great. That's totally fine. Fiber is extremely important. Um, and what's interesting is, uh, of all the the health and fitness coaches that are out there, and this is not to like toot my own horn and my husband's horn or whatever, we are one of the few people who do macros for people that will actually look at people's fiber count. And the reason we do this is because your macros, uh, the what you're eating also matters. So yes, the calories that you're eating matter in terms of calories in versus calories out, right? But the nutrient we look for nutrient dense foods. That's what we want to fill the majority of our day with is nutrient dense items. So I've had people that have done macros where I will look in their MyFitnessPal diary and they're getting like six grams of fiber a day because they're eating protein shakes, egg whites, and then cereal and pop tarts. And they're like, well, it fits. Okay, but at what cost? So you're not getting any good fiber and you're like, are you going to the bathroom? Like what is, what is your cholesterol look like? All of these things that fiber can help with. And not a lot of people are actually looking at that, which I find kind of interesting that not many other people look at, actually look at their clients' diaries to see what they're eating and look at the micronutrient content of what their clients are eating. So fruits and vegetables are are obviously a, a big one. And I think everybody in this country could use to eat some more <laughs> fruits and vegetables. But for people just starting, I like to go, instead of saying, you know, you need to eat X many servings of fruits or X many servings of vegetables a day. Instead, I like to conceptualize your plate. So if you're looking at your plate, I want half of it to be filled with a vegetable at three of your meals. over, So let's say you eat five times a day at three of those five meals a day. I want to see half of your plate, have something, have a vegetable of some kind. Doesn't matter. It. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Really? Okay. I honestly don't care what it is. I, I don't want it to be covered in sauce or cheese, but I don't care what type of vegetable it is. Just okay. make half of your plate a vegetable. It can even just be lettuce. Like that's fine. Let's start somewhere. Maybe we can add some tomatoes or bell peppers to that a little bit later, but let's, let's get something. Let's get some sort of vegetable on the plate for three of your five meals over the course of the day. And then, so if you're, if we're, let's, let's use that visual half the plates, vegetables, what's the, is the other half a a protein or is, is that three quarters of the plate? So I would say, I would say probably two thirds of what's left should be a protein. And then the, the third little sliver, there can be some sort of carbohydrate or fat. It's really kind of up to the person. And again, it's going to depend on how many meals a day that they're eating. Right. So if they're eating three meals a day, that may look, look a little bit different than if they're eating five meals a day. So the, the veggie allotment, I like to use that visual for a reason um, because I don't necessarily want to quantify that for somebody. So I, I like that visual representation for somebody so they're not, you know, trying to measure a certain number of vegetables over the course of their day. It's just easier for them to kind of visualize it on their plate. And and one thing too, maybe, and it might be good to clear up again, I'm thinking, okay, if someone's listened to this and they're very new trying to get in this we've mentioned macros a few times. Can mm-hmm. you just share kind of the breakdown of, of macros and maybe any insight in there, just so they're kind of caught up to speed on sure. the conversation? So macronutrients are your proteins, your carbs, and your fats. And just to backpedal a little bit, I would never in a million years recommend macronutrient tracking for a beginner ever hard stop. Like I don't like using absolutes, but I will use an absolute in this case. I do not recommend macro tracking for a beginner because it is meticulous. It can actually cause disordered eating behaviors and patterns. And most people don't track correctly to begin with. It actually takes a long time to teach somebody how to correctly track macros and my fitness pal or whatever it is that you're using. So this is why we are much more of a habit-based approach versus being tied to an app to kind of figure out what you need. So that little soapbox aside, um, your proteins, your carbs, and your fats are the, are the three major macronutrients for the total number of calories that you eat over the course of the day. So, um, a lot of 
CrossFitters in particular are on this sort of macro tracking kick now, right? So um, I don't even really know when it became popular in the CrossFit world, um, but you hear about it a lot now in um, in the CrossFit community in particular in terms of tracking the number of calories that they eat per day, making sure that they're hitting a certain percentage of proteins, carbohydrates, and fat. The thought process being that that will determine your body composition, which it does. Um, but again, that's not uh, the path that I think a beginner needs to go down in order to start seeing results. I do not think that they need to get in the weeds like that. Well, again, let's go, let's go back and keep rehashing what we mentioned earlier. <laughs> it's like slow and steady out of the gate, kind of let right. the, like the tortoise and the hare. Let's, let's right. just kind of move down the path. And then eventually yeah. maybe that's something for sure. you down the road. Sure. Right? Mm-hmm. So as we're looking at nutrition, and this is something that was really hard for me. So I'm going to ask, cause I think a lot of people may be challenged with this. It's one thing to say, Hey, Brian, go ahead and you know eat your protein, put your vegetables on there. But it's another thing to actually go shop for this stuff and, yeah. and put it in the car and kind of seeing it. Is there any guidance you would share on the shopping experience, things people should consider, just anything you might talk about with your clients that might be helpful? That's a really good question. Um, I'm not one of those people that's going to say stick to the perimeter of the store because I think that... Um, that doesn't really account for some of the social determinants of health, like financial status. So a lot of prepackaged foods like canned tuna, like things that are perfectly healthy and reasonable, canned vegetables are all in the center aisles, right? So I'm not going to tell somebody to just shop the perimeter. I think that is a little bit misguided. Um, I think people do need to spend more time flipping things over and reading labels. So reading how much protein is in something, how many carbs are in something, how much fat is in something, and then looking at the ingredients. I'm not one of these ingredient people that is like, you know, you can't have any artificial sweeteners and no red dye. Like, no, we're not going down that road. But I think having an overall understanding of the of the caloric impact of what you want to buy, as well as protein in particular, is really kind of what I fixate on when I'm teaching people how to grocery shop. So a great example of this is the condiment aisle, right? So condiments are another area. I mean, talking about the coffee creamer. So if you go to the grocery store and you start flipping around containers of creamer, I think a lot of people would actually be surprised at the caloric amount that is in some of these foods that they're eating and they don't even really think about it. Right. So creamer is a great example of that. Well, um, by the way, so, too, that this is also, if you go to your, if you go to Starbucks, you get your pumpkin spice latte, right. That's got a lot of calories. Don't be afraid it does. to, you know, look at the, it know, does. The, the menu there and see, cause that's something that's like, Oh, I just, I went and got a coffee. Well, no, you didn't. You right. Had you, you had a meal. Half, it was a full meal. <laughs> well, um, and that's, you know, those are, those are other really easy swaps to make. Right. So they actually have, um, like the skinny vanilla latte. And so I hate that terminology, but like they have that on the menu for a reason, because they also have sugar-free syrups available. So you can get, if I get a pumpkin spice latte, I usually get the sugar-free pumpkin syrup and I get it made with skim milk. So I'm cutting down my the calories from fat. I'm cutting down the calories from the super sugary syrup. So, and it tastes exactly the same. So again, it's just being educated on the caloric impact of what you're what you're consuming. Now, if you if that is calorically worth it to you to have that that day the full fat version and the full carb version, knock yourself out, but just be aware of what the impact is of the foods that you're, that you're looking to buy. And when I first started, um, in prepping for figure competitions, I spent hours now, granted, this was part of the disordered behavior of bodybuilding competitions, but I would spend hours in the store flipping over labels and reading them and analyzing them. And, even though it was part of a larger issue with food, it did teach me the caloric impact of a lot of the things that I liked to eat on a routine basis. And it was an eye-opening experience. So I think looking at the foods that you're currently buying from the grocery store, flip over a few of those labels and take a peek at it. And then if there's something similar that is a lower calorie version, flip that label over and look at it. So if you're Greek yogurt, for example, right, we talked about that earlier, there's a full fat version and there's a no fat version. Take a look at the, at the caloric difference 
in those labels and the protein difference, the fat difference, the carbohydrate difference, and pick the option that is going to be best for you and your goals and your needs and your wants. So just being more educated on what is in the food that you're eating from an ingredient standpoint, as well as from a caloric standpoint is really, really important when you're shopping. And to make sure that you don't overwhelm yourself, I would say stick to just a few things each time you go into the grocery store. So if you're buying meat today at the grocery store, maybe spend a couple of extra minutes looking at the different levels of ground beef that are available to you in your store. So, you know, 93% versus 90% versus 86% versus 80%. There's a huge difference in saturated fat content and caloric content and all of those. So look at it and sort of understand how that is going to impact you and what your goals may be. Yeah. Well, one of the other things and. In- I don't, I don't know if I'm way off on this or not, but I, I think I've gone to the store enough and I've analyzed this is you think at the beginning, you're going to spend a lot more if you spend, if you have fruits and vegetables and meat and all that stuff versus the package. But what mm-hmm. I found is you actually, and then I eat less, but like you get filled up more with like, if I eat a, you know, an apple and you know, whatever, some, some other stuff that's actually whole foodish. Um, uh, if that's even a word <laughs> <laughs> versus eating, like I eat macaroni and cheese, right? Right. Yeah. Macaroni and cheese is a lot cheaper, but at the end of the day, I'm going to have to eat more to exactly. probably get my filling of that. So I think that's something too, for folks to look at, like, yeah, it costs less to do this, but what's it actually doing for you in terms of not only filling you up, but obviously the nutrition aspect. Right. And that's, that's actually a really good point because there's a difference between nutrient, something that is nutrient dense and something that is calorically dense. So we talked a little bit before about protein being a filling macronutrient, right? So if, if I put somebody on, um, you know, a diet when they're first starting out and they're used to eating mostly prepackaged foods, and all of a sudden I switch them over to whole foods, those more nutrient dense foods actually are higher volume, meaning you can eat more of them. They take up more physical space in your stomach, which is why eating 200 calories worth of an apple is going to feel very different for you than eating 200 calories of a pop tart, which is really just one pop tart. So you're going to be taking up a lot more space in your stomach with those nutrient dense items than you are with less nutrient dense, more calorically dense items. So you will probably end up buying less overall if you're sticking to more nutrient dense items, um, just as, just as a sort of byproduct of the amount of food that you're going to be able to eat. And I think the other thing, if you go and touch on maybe, and then there's one or two other topics to maybe chat about, but I, I, I don't know about you. I mean, I know I used to eat like crap and now <laughs> I, I like to think I eat really good. You know, 90% plus probably of my meals are fairly like, again, a couple ingredients or one ingredient types of foods. Mm-hmm. And what I found with that is I feel so much better. So again, it's like, yeah, maybe it costs a little more or this or that, but the reality is I feel better when I eat foods that are that are not processed, that don't mm-hmm. have a ton of junk in them. So mm-hmm. is that something, you know, do you work with a lot of your clients on is like, hey, we want to have this because of these calories and all this stuff. But at the end of the day, it's also, you're going to probably sleep better. You're going to yeah. be in the better mood to work out. Right. Maybe you're not going to be as grouchy. Like that's yeah. a huge benefit of eating healthy too, right? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it it goes such a long way in making you feel and perform better as well. Um, But that's not to say too, that you can't fit in some, you know, more treat like things into the course of your day just to bring you happiness. Right. So that's a fine line. That's something I'm actually really passionate about because I think um, especially in the CrossFit community, sometimes I think we kind of creep down the orthorexic path a little bit in our food morality. And we, you know, there's clean and unclean, healthy and unhealthy, good and bad. And I, I don't like that dichotomous thinking and that language around food. I think it's really harmful and damaging, but I think if you are, that's why I like the term nutrient dense, Because if you are sticking to predominantly nutrient dense items over the course of your day, yes, you're going to feel better. You're going to perform better. You're going to sleep better. Your skin is probably going to look better. Your hair is going to look better. Lots of things happen when you eat more nutrient dense foods, but that conversely does not mean that there's not a place for some less 
nutrient dense foods over the course of the day, especially if those really bring you joy. My coffee creamer is a great example of that. You can pry that from my cold dead hands. <laughs> hey, you know, again, I think having that having that little moderation exactly is, is always is always helpful. And moderation is the key, right? We've we've heard that right. spouted often that, you know, it's moderation, but that moderation is extremely difficult for most people. Most people are incapable of moderating. And yeah. that's one of those habits, again, that can kind of take a while to develop is how do I include some of those things in my diet in a responsible moderate manner without going overboard on them. And that's a very hard line to toe. Well, and, and again, we could probably spend an hour more talking about nutrition <laughs> and maybe, sure. maybe that's for a, a part two we'll do down the road <laughs> at your game. But one of the other legs of this stool here, and, and I'm going to kind of put, you know, I'll kind of put like physical and mental health together in that, in one bucket, even potentially, mm -hmm. um, but is sleep. You know, I found that if I eat right, if I'm physically active, I sleep really well. Now I also yeah. created a lot of habits for my bedtime routine. I won't get into on this episode, sure. but <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I think yes. if you sleep well, those are things important. But yeah. one of the last thing I want to ask about is again, folks that are saying, I want to commit. I want to actually start working out. I want to eat better. How much do you talk with them about their sleep patterns and getting to bed at the right time, waking up even at the right time, those type of things? It's so funny. Sleep is the one thing that people just refuse to change. And it's probably the easiest thing for them to change. Now, I'm not going to sit here. I don't have children. So I'm not going to sit here and preach to you like I understand what it's like to have a newborn infant at home. Right. And that's not what I'm talking about here. I'm talking about people that have kids that are that have a set bedtime routine. They don't get up in the middle of the night and bother you. There's very little that you can do about that. Right. So I'm I'm talking about the people that have established children that sleep through the night that don't harass you in the middle of the night. Um, you as an adult have the ability to moderate and manage your own sleep. And I like these people that always say like, oh, I can't get more than five to six hours a night. But if you if you were to look at their phone time and how much time they spend scrolling aimlessly, you know, three hours before bed, you can fix your sleep patterns very easily. And it's, it is the one thing that people really will fight you on is changing their sleep behavior. And it's probably the most, I would, I would honestly put it over nutrition. I would put sleep over nutrition. And I know a lot of other coaches that would say the same thing. And yet that is one area where people will just refuse to change. Yeah. And then they'll, you know, they'll start to stall. They won't be lifting like they could be in the gym, which means, I mean, that has downstream effects as well. All of these things that hinge upon that sleep never get addressed because they just refuse to change their sleep patterns. And, you know, you mentioned adjusting your bedtime routine, but I think that is something very important to talk about because I don't know about you, but before I really started paying attention to my sleep patterns, I'm in bed scrolling through Instagram, you know, at night before I, I try to sleep with the blue light in my face, you know, or a TV in the bedroom or maybe yeah. working out super close to bedtime or taking caffeine too close to bedtime or, a room that's really bright and not dark enough, a room that's not cold enough, all these things that are well within our control that we can take back into control. We just simply don't do. Yeah. And it's little stuff. I mean, I, I'll mention a few things now that you bring it up. I, I, cause I've done a lot of, what we call it research, reading, studying on this. Cause this is a huge thing for me because I used yeah. to always have issues sleeping. Yeah. And what I realized was that it was the simple things. It was the, uh, turning the technology off at least 30 minutes. I know it's 60 to 90 minutes is recommended. Yeah. It yeah. was like, you know, it's funny, actually. I don't know if you have this. I just got a, um, I turned, I took out the white light in my room and I put an mm -hmm. orange light. An in, orange light. Oh my yep. gosh. Yep. And I can still read. I could still yes. read. because that, So that's one of the things too, is reading before bed. But yep. I, I think the biggest thing for me, and this would be my encouragement for anyone, is going to sleep at the same time every night. Yes. So e whether it's yeah. 930 or 1030 or 1130 or whatever, it doesn't matter yes. as long as you go to the same because your body starts getting used to it. You I know? totally agree. Waking up, going to bed and waking up, whether it be a weekend or a weekday, super important. And that, you know, we see that a lot too, where people during the week, you know, Monday or Sunday night through Thursday night, they're going to bed at like 11 PM and they're getting up at 11 AM. 
Yeah. Um, but then, you know, over or sorry, reverse that. So on the weekend nights, they're they're going to bed late and but waking up late. And then during right. the week, they're still going to bed late, but they're waking up, you know, four hours earlier. Yeah. And that is really disruptive to your circadian rhythm. And that's one of the easiest things right away to fix is saying, all right, instead of 11 o'clock in the morning on the weekends, I'm going to get up at seven. And the reason that people don't want to do that is because it sucks. Yeah. Like it sucks to start doing that. Um, but that is such an easy thing to change. And then incrementally. So what I, what I try to do people is incrementally is let's start to move back that bedtime. So if you're going to bed at 11 tomorrow night, let's try 10 50. Like, let's just get you under the covers by 10 50 and see what happens. Because if you try to go to bed three hours earlier, you're going to sit there and stare at the ceiling. Right. Yeah. So it's, you have to sort of baby step that back in order to get somebody to an earlier bedtime. And just anecdotally, when my husband and I moved out here to Maui, um, I actually work East Coast hours. So my nine to five job, I actually work nine to five East Coast time, which is I get up at 4 a.m. here. Mm -hmm. um, so I start my day super early. And I was one of those people when I lived in North Carolina, I would go to bed at 11 and wake up at seven. So having to adjust my yeah. clock to going to bed at I we go to bed every night now at 730. Oh it was God. not an easy task. That was not an easy task. And on the weekends, I have to set an alarm on the weekends. Otherwise, I'll just I'll sleep for as long as I can. I get up at five on the weekend. So instead of four, I do allow myself that one extra hour, but we still go to bed at seven, seven thirty on the weekends, yeah. regardless. Wow. That was one of the things you mentioned the alarm, but one of the big eye opening things I learned, I, um, I think I was reading uh, Dr. Matthew Walker's book, why we sleep. And he talks about if you, this is actually for some, it's everyone at home is if you have to be woken up by your alarm, you're underslept. Yeah, it's basically the kind of the, the analysis, the research. So it's like, okay, yeah, let's start kind of bringing that back. And let's try to wake up before you're going to wake up sometimes by alarm. But it's actually interesting when you prioritize yeah. that, you start waking up before your alarm would yes. go off, which is yeah. really, which is like, yeah. okay, now I'm actually my body's in tune. Yeah, again, I don't longer, know if you've longer steps. <laughs> I don't know if you've looked into the um the sunrise alarm clocks. Have you seen those that they sort of simulate I, the I've natural? I've seen those. I haven't, I haven't done those. I so have I my have blackout one. shades. I like, I have to have. I um, have one of those. Um, and the reason that I do is because it it's a, it's an easy way to wake me up in the morning. That doesn't wake my husband up. So Alan yeah. doesn't get up until about five in the morning. I get up at, at three 45. Oh, so he sleeps in a long time. Yeah. <laughs> he, he gets a full hour extra than I do. Um, but I actually love the sunrise alarm clock and I have not over like I, it wakes me up every single morning and I it, it it will start to play like bird chirps or whatever you set it to okay. if you if you sleep past the point that you're supposed to sleep but at around at around 3 45 is when the sun on my clock starts to rise and I usually am sort of rolling over to shut it off at around 3 43 every single morning habitually but that is a great way to also not Oh, like alert, like just completely scare you out of your sleep. Cause that is also a terrible, yeah. that's a terrible way to start your day yeah. is being just slammed out of your natural sleep cycle and just jolted awake. That is so terrible for you. So that's, but you do have to be susceptible to light. So I'm one of those people that if it gets light in a room, it's going to, it's going to wake me up. So if you're not like it, Alan is clueless. So he does not wake up to it whatsoever. It would not work for him in a million years. But for me, it it's awesome. I wake up feeling refreshed, alert, ready to go. I don't feel tired. It's it's awesome. So if you're the type of person who's looking for a new alarm clock, I highly recommend one of those sunrise alarm clocks. They're fantastic. You have two links to send me now. I know. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, uh, we'll put that in the show notes here. Um, yeah, I think to, to kind of loop kind of a bow around this is, again, it goes back to knowing yourself. And and one I, I talk a lot about is like accepting who you are. Like since some people, yeah. if you could really be accountable and say, gosh, you know, yeah, I am really that person that goes to bed at midnight watching, I fall asleep watching TV. Maybe you have to move the TV out of your room. Yes. You know, at some, you might start and say, let me try to turn my TV off at 10. But at some point you might have to go back to atomic habits. You might have to remove that out to yeah. be able to make that change. Everyone's, you know, has to yeah. know themselves. You know? Exactly. And I think in, in everything that we've talked about, knowing yourself and knowing what you are and are not willing to do, that is the question that you need to ask yourself before 
any goal that you set, any new habit that you're trying to achieve, you need to really be introspective and ask yourself, what are you willing to do right now? So like all the nutritional things that we talked about with protein, adding some vegetables, getting rid of liquid calories, maybe you only pick one of those to start. I'm okay with that. Pick the easiest one for you that you can, it's non-negotiable. You can do it without having to really think about it and focus on it. Pick one thing and start there. Don't pick two things, pick one thing and start there. That's a great place. Uh, I think that's a great place to wrap up this conversation. I'm looking <laughs> at the time. I'm like, gosh, this, this time just flew by. Um <laughs> Anything else you want to share with folks listening in? Anything else? Maybe it's something you've been thinking about as you go into the new year. Like, God, this is something you've been, you know, working with a lot of clients and seeing it. Just any, any other final thoughts, I guess, to uh, share with the myself, the folks? Um, I will say my new year's pitch every single year. And this is actually for more established gym members than it is for new people getting started on a healthy habit and a healthy lifestyle. Because those people are, they've set a goal, you know, their new year's resolution, they're ready to go do it, knock it out of the park for the people that are established and that have been going to the gym for the last 365 days or longer, please don't be a jerk to the new people who show up at the gym this year. A lot of people like to complain about, you know, the new people don't know gym etiquette, teach them, help them, show them, be welcoming. A lot of people will quit on their new year's resolutions and on going to the gym, not necessarily because somebody has gone out of the way to be mean to them, but because people have ignored them. So one of my, I actually made a Facebook post about this the other day. For those of you who maybe just ignore the new people, my challenge to you this year is to actually help somebody. So if somebody looks lost staring at the equipment or somebody's using a machine the wrong way, or somebody is not adhering to what you would consider to be appropriate gym etiquette, help that person this year. Yeah. There was a time we were all our first time in the gym. A hundred percent. For some reason we forget that, you know? Yep. And I used to be that when I was, a when I was in bodybuilding and I hate to say it, but bodybuilders are notorious for this. Like we think that we are better than everybody else. And I can say that as a former one who used to think that you are not better than anybody else. You stepped foot into your first gym once at some point act accordingly. Beth, great way to end the conversation. <laughs> this is a this is a lot of fun. I, I know we went on a lot of tangents, but I certainly appreciate you coming on and sharing uh, your thoughts and wisdom and insight. Where can everyone say hello to you if they want to check you out online and say hello on the on the socials? Where, where's the best spot? So on Instagram, our business page is Dr. Allen Bacon, and that is spelled A L L A N. <laughs> Bacon, don't misspell the Allen. Uh, my personal Instagram page, which really is a personal page, I've kind of stopped posting fitness content there, um, is BP Bacon 13. I'd post about my life in Maui, my dog, some fitness stuff every now and then. Um, but Dr. Allen Bacon is our fitness page on Instagram. Same for TikTok. Um, it's Maui Athletics actually on TikTok. Um, and then on Facebook, we have two pages. One is our business page, which is just Maui Athletics. And the other is Gym and Fitness by Maui Athletics is our Facebook group. And we share Maui memes. Athletics, MauiAthletics.com website. Yes, correct. MauiAthletics.com. Yep. Okay. Can't cool. believe I forgot the big one. <laughs> no, that's, that's okay. I'll, I'll link it all up in the show notes. <laughs> but this was a lot of fun. Thank you so much for coming on and, uh, and having this conversation. I really appreciate it. Thank you for having me. I had a great time. Thank mm -hmm. you.